Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. We'll be there in just a moment. We're continuing on in this series, the series throughout the Gospel of John, with a particular aim that John had in writing it that we have mentioned each week, that these truths, these things that we're looking at were written, that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And we keep emphasizing this at the beginning of each sermon, that that this is the point, this is what we're aiming for. And really, these are the truths of Scripture. Oftentimes, when we come to them, they're, they're meant to reveal to us a truth about God and who he is in a way that leads us to respond a certain way. Right? They're written for the purpose that we might believe in him. But they're also written for the purpose of helping us recognize when we're not believing that truth, what that's meant to mean. They're meant at times to help us make adjustments so that we can continue to walk by faith, right? Like the, John was writing to an audience and, and they were, he, they were people within his audience that he was writing to that didn't necessarily believe that Jesus was the Messiah, or, or didn't necessarily believe that that meant he was the son of God, or didn't necessarily believe that that, that was meant to lead them to a particular response. It wasn't just a, a, an acknowledgement of a fact, but that believing, true belief, was always reflected in action, action that produces life. And, and so when John's writing, there's times when the, his audience might have been like, you know, I didn't realize that to be true. In weeks past, we've, we've covered various topics like the fact that, that Jesus is, is the source of living water and any who co- come to him can drink and, and, and find satisfaction in life or, or he's the light of the world. We've looked at, we looked at that last week. And there might have been times where someone would come to a passage like that and realize, you know what? I've been, I've been walking by another light. I've been dependent upon something else. And so these truths are written not so that we can just agree with some statements, but that we can consider what they mean for us and make adjustments as necessary. That we would believe and that by believing we could experience life, not just life in eternity, not just when we get to go to heaven that we get to suffer through as best as we can right now and, and just wait for the day where Nadal is, is taken away and we get to experience eternal life in heaven, but that eternal life was meant to be experienced on various levels now that relationship that we are meant to experience with Jesus. You might remember, I don't know when it was, maybe about a month and a half ago or so, when I, I preached the sermon and, and I pointed that out, that you know, we have a misconception to think that eternal life just means heaven, right? Because John 17, if you were to look into that passage, it was the only place in the, in the Gospels where Jesus actually defines eternal life. And in that passage, it says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It was this relationship that we were meant to experience today. And there's times where we're not necessarily living in a right relationship or not experiencing the relationship we're meant to have with our king. And adjustments need to be made. So last week, as I mentioned, we were continuing to, to look at a conversation that Jesus was having with religious leaders at the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and there was challenges as far as them trying to get Jesus to, to make it clear who he was. Um, and Jesus has been pointed out that he's been kind of clear about who he was all along. He's been pointing to the fact that he's the Messiah. They just haven't been able to hear. He hasn't been point blank clear with them, but he's been pointing to a lot of things that they should have recognized. All right, and last week we looked at the fact that Jesus had, had called them to walk in light. And he said that those who believe in me walk in light and, and, and do not walk in darkness. And what he's doing in that moment for the religious leaders, what he's doing for us as we are, as John is recording these events, he's helping us to, to realize that there are times when there's a disconnect, right? When, when there are moments where we feel like things are dark around us or moments when we feel like there's no satisfaction. And, and what Jesus is doing at the Feast of Tabernacles is he's helping people realize that the things that they were practicing during those moments were meant to point to him. And so the, the conversation continues this morning. 
as, as there's, uh, there's another back and forth interaction that he has. And I've labeled this sermon uh, Kingdom Competencies. And there was a, a specific reason for that. It, um, as uh, we like to point to on, on, on occasion, using the, the terminology, we're meant to live following our King, King Jesus. And we're meant to live in his kingdom as we await his eternal kingdom. Like we're meant to live according to the teachings and practices that our king has made clear in his word. And, what, and, and, and so what is a, a competency? If there's a kingdom competency, what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, to define competency, it is the ability to do something well or efficiently. It's something that you need ahead of time in order to perform a task well. And so when I talk about kingdom competencies, I'm talking about things that help us follow our king. And, and without these competencies, um, we kind of are ill-prepared or, or we don't necessarily respond always the way that we're meant to um, when put to a test as we follow Jesus. And so what we're going to look at in, in, in defining what these, some of these competencies are is we're going to look at some bad examples of them. Because the, the, the people in the crowd, the religious leaders and, and others who were essentially um, giving Jesus such a difficult time in this moment, they reflect the opposite of what we're meant uh, to reflect when it comes to following our king. And so let's dive into the passage, John chapter 8, verse 37, and I'll begin to unpack them. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Again, this is picking up a conversation where, where Jesus is trying to help them see the disconnect in their faith and in their life. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. And so in this first section of our passage, one of the, the competencies I want to identify is, is we need to have room to receive instruction from the king. Jesus makes the acknowledgement because they've been pointing to the fact that they're descendants of Abraham. You're, you're, you're offspring of Abraham. You claim to be his children. But then why don't you do what Abraham did? Why are you seeking to kill me if you're, if you're that's not the way he lived his life, right? And, 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 and they, you know, basically Jesus says, based on your actions, you're pointing to the fact that, that you're, you're not following Abraham at all. You're following your father, who he's going to identify in just a moment. And to this, they get really defensive, and they say, no, 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 God's our father. He's, we're, we're children of God. He's the only one we truly follow. We're not Ill illegitimate. We're his, his children, and again, Jesus was saying, listen, if, if, if you were God's children, you would be responding a lot differently in your circumstances right now. You wouldn't be seeking to kill me. And what's the problem? What, what's causing them to reject Jesus so much? He, he identifies this. You have no room for my word. You can't hear what I'm saying. There's something blocking. There's something filling your heart with with." either deception or anger or something that's, that's keep, keeping you from being able to hear and respond. He's, he, in this moment, he's, again, helping expose the disconnect. He's pointing to the fruit. You say, you're children of Abraham, why are you trying to kill me? Like, is that modeling your father, your supposed father? Is that demonstrating the faith that you're meant to live with? You see, as, as followers of our king, we, we have to have room to receive instruction from him in our lives. And that instruction sometimes is teaching, which is 
probably some of the easiest to receive, but it's also correction, rebuke, it's, it's training, it's, it's willing to receive whatever our king needs to say. It's, it's saying, word of God, speak. I, I don't need to tell you everything that you already know. I need you to speak into my circumstance things I need to hear. And being willing to say, you know what? Even if it's something I really don't want to hear right now. We have to have room to receive instruction from our king or we're not going to be able to follow him. See, this is the truth that, that would be beneficial for all of us to recognize. No matter how long we follow Jesus, no matter what we've accomplished for him, no matter any of the details you could attach to that, is it possible that maybe you don't know everything you need to know. Because if that's possible, then maybe there's room for us to be willing to listen to what our king wants to tell us. You see, for the, the, the religious leaders, the, um, the Pharisees, the, the Jews who were rejecting Jesus in this moment, they didn't have room for that. They didn't need to hear what he had to say. I mean, they were the authority of their life. They were in control. They were the ones who were given the promises and the scriptures. And they were the ones who knew what they needed to do. They didn't have to listen to some itinerant rabbi from Galilee of all places. They didn't have room for Jesus. But maybe they didn't know everything they needed to know. And maybe if they were willing to receive instruction from their king, it would have led to an application that would have brought the change that they needed to experience. Because the right application changes our outcomes. The right correction in the right moment can, can, can save us from going down a very destructive path or, 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 or leading us on a path that's going to lead to life. What did, what did Jesus say at the end of the Sermon of the Mount? We talked about this, and I pointed at it at various points and throughout this series. If anyone hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man who builds his house on the rock, right? So when we make the right application, it changes our outcomes when things happen in our lives, when storms come. And so maybe for us, we can look at this and, and realize, if, if I think that there is little room for God to speak in, if I'm leaving little room for God to speak in my situation, maybe I need to make an adjustment because if I'm going to follow my king, I always have to leave room for my king to speak into my life. Listen, circumstances cause us to get off track. This is one, even those with best intentions. Things happen and, and, and it can lead to a domino effect where if we're not careful and if we're not listening to our king, those dominoes can keep falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. But when we leave room for him to speak, he's able to help us get back on track. But the Pharisees didn't want none of that. They were unwilling to listen to him. They were unwilling to pay attention to their own actions. I mean, if they would have just looked, it would have been obvious. Why were they seeking to kill Jesus? It didn't make any sense. There was nothing that was justifying that response, but they were listening to the wrong voice, and they were unwilling to listen to the one they needed to listen to. We have to leave room to receive instruction from the king if we're going to follow him. If we think otherwise, I think God's going to make that obvious in the things that end up happening. So let's continue on in our passage as we look at the next competency. Jesus goes on and he says, listen, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Challenging, challenging words. And in this, Jesus helps us realize this, that we need to understand that the king expects our allegiance. Jesus keeps going, why are you guys so unwilling to hear what I'm telling you? 
And he, and he points out some things, right? He, I mean, he's saying, you're following the example of your father because he murdered. He was seeking to kill. He was seeking to destroy. He lived by deception. He lied. He, he, that's when he um, lies. He's just speaking out of his character. He's the father of lies. And you're following his example. He's pointing out things to help them realize, oh man, there's things that are lining up. If we call ourselves children of God, then why are we seeking to murder an innocent man? If we are, call ourselves children of God, why are we so entrenched in deception? And he asks this question, why are you rejecting me when I speak the truth? I mean, can, anyone, can any of you point to something and, and, and convict me of sin? And if you can't, why don't you receive what I say? And then he goes up to, to make that last point. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you can't hear, you don't hear, is that you do not belong to God. He's, he's saying, listen, God, if you belong to God, he expects your allegiance. If you belong to God, he expects you to hear the things he wants to say. That, that's, that, that, there's no um, room for uh, moderation in that. Like, God wants your allegiance part of the time, and then you can go do what you want the other, the other portion of the time. And so how does that truth, understanding that the king expects your allegiance, how does that help us live effectively in the kingdom, right? Because this is a competency. It, it helps us to have the ability to do something well or efficiently. Why does this, I mean, it seems kind of basic, right? God wants your allegiance, but, but it's something that we have to understand fully what it means. The reason we have to recognize this is because we are incredibly lousy at following multiple things faithfully. Jesus made that clear. You can't serve two masters, right? You'll be devoted to one and despise the other, or you'll neglect the one and, and, and serve the other. I mean, you can't do, serve multiple things. And the outcome of us trying to give allegiance to multiple masters, what does that do for us? It leaves us feeling exasperated because we're trying to live to please ourselves or live to please this person or live to please um, you know, those at work or, and then try to fit God in the midst of it. And all we're doing is feeling like there's this internal tug of war, back and forth, up and down, and we just feel worn out. And no matter what we try, we're going to continue to feel worn out if we have allegiance to multiple things. This is such an important truth about following Jesus. He requires our complete allegiance to him. Because when he has our complete allegiance, we give him access to speak to all the areas of our lives. We don't hang do not enter signs on, on certain portions of it. And, and think, well, you know, I've got this portion, and this is the portion where I'm going to follow my king, but in this area, this area, this area, this area, I'm going to do what I want. He requires, expects our complete allegiance because he wants to speak into those areas of our lives. And the reality is, if he's not speaking, if we're not giving him access because we've been given him our allegiance, we won't get very far. See, the king kind of has this idea that he wants to be king. I know that might sound um, pretty, pretty, pretty deep, right? Like Jesus expects to lead us. Jesus expects that he's the one calling the shots in the way that we live our lives. That's just been the expectation. It's like a, it's a difference uh, between viewing God as, as someone who, who accomplishes our wishes and viewing, him as, uh, viewing us as someone who lives for his purposes. We won't get far. We won't produce much for the king in his kingdom if he doesn't have our allegiance, if he doesn't have our hearts. Because what ends up happening? If he doesn't have our hearts, something else is going to have our hearts. It's going to produce problems. And the, the heart of all of our problems, I've said this on, on many occasions and continue to because it's an important truth, the heart of all of our problems is the problem that's going on in our hearts. That's where it has to start. That's where you have to focus on it. And so God wants our hearts because he wants to fix the problem. But in order to fix the problem, he has to have allegiance. There's this passage of scripture in, in Psalm. And it's, it's a really, really awesome passage. But we see this importance of allegiance played out. Let me read it and then I'll explain what I'm saying. 
Verse 6 of, of chapter or Psalm 40, it says, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. This is an awesome passage. Because what it reminds us of is God doesn't delight in us just simply throwing him a bone every once in a while, doing, a, doing something for him. He doesn't delight in, in simple you know, acts of obedience that are devoid of, of true devotion. And what the psalmist says, I love the imagery he puts there. You've given me an open ear to hear what you're really desiring after. You want my heart. See, I love that, that, that verse because that it points out the, the, tr- the truth that we, we've already identified in our, the first section, that we have to have room to receive instruction from our king. You've given me an open ear to receive that. But then there's that truth. I delight to do your will. You don't have begrudging allegiance. You don't have forced allegiance. You have a delightful allegiance that I delight to do your will and to follow your word. See, God's desire for us is to recognize who he is. Not that he's just a king, but he's the good king, the great king, the one worthy of complete devotion. There's no one who who could possibly compare to God. And so why wouldn't we serve him with all of our hearts if he truly is that great? I mean, if if we sing songs about how great thou art and and how great is our God and and all these really awesome songs of worship and then go out and live contrary, chasing and serving other kings, what are we really saying? God, how okay you are. That that song doesn't, wouldn't have been recorded, you know? (laughs) So I said, no, thank you. God desires our hearts, recognizing how great he is. And then recognizing that there's this desire, a willingness to respond. He has my allegiance. I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. Another reason that's an awesome, we're not going to look at Psalm 40 um, as a whole, but another reason that that's an awesome part of that passage is that at the beginning of Psalm 40, it talks about how um, the writer was in a pit and how God lifted, it up, lifted him up from the pit, put a new song in his mouth, a hymn of praise to God. Many, and see will, many will see and hear. And I think this is an important truth of God bringing that, the psalmist out of the pit. I delight to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. When God has your allegiance, he moves in your circumstances. But see, the audience, they weren't interested in that. They weren't interested in, in, in really allowing God to have their allegiance. And what they ended up doing is they attacked anyone who threatened who they were really serving, themselves. This is exactly what they were doing to Jesus. And it was a, 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 just a, a clear sign of the reality that they truly weren't following the king, truly weren't children of who they said they were. Let's finish up in verse 48. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. (laughs) But I do know him. And obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and yet you've seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. 
At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. You know, one of the things, that, just as a side note, I love about John's recounting of this is, is it's like, yep, they tried to kill him, and they couldn't. Yep, they tried to stone him, and they didn't. Like, it was like, man, if I would, I would have tried to, maybe got the picture that this isn't something I should be doing, because evidently, every time they tried, they were failing. But um, one of the things we see on, on getting to the competency in this passage is this truth that our reactions should honor the king and point people to truth. So it's, it's one of those things that is funny but not funny. Like, and really it's not funny at all, but it's just, it's a sad humor, I guess we could say it. So, you know, they're, they're interacting with Jesus and, and the conversation is not going their way. And so what do they say? They, they already have identified the fact they know where Jesus comes from, right? Like they know he, where, where he was born. They, they know those things. And yet they say, are, are, isn't it true that you're a Samaritan and you're demon-possessed? And for us in the context, what they're doing is they're trying to, they're trying to get Jesus to react. They're trying to you know, insult him just, just to see if they can poke him to the point of, of giving a reaction. And I just find it interesting. Like, again, the fruit is evidence of the condition. So things aren't going their way. Jesus is, 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 is for, all, um, for all intents and purposes, winning this conversation, this argument that he's having with these religious leaders. And all they can do is saying, well, listen, you're just demon-possessed and a Samaritan. We don't have to listen to you. And what, they're just trying to humiliate him in public. And I love Jesus' reaction. I'm not demon-possessed. You're just trying to dishonor me. I'm seeking to honor God. I'm not going to react to your childish um, accusations right now. But what he does in that moment, he says, listen, there's an opportunity for life for all who believe in me. Those who believe in me will never taste death. To which they weren't really understanding what Jesus was saying. And so they, what are you talking about? Who are you making yourself out to be? Like, Abraham died, the prophets died, and yet you say that if someone believes in you, they'll never taste death. Who do you think you are? And Jesus, I think on purpose, is helping to get them to a point of what, what he's about to say. But he, he says, listen, you guys say you're children of Abraham, you say you believe in him, and yet... You don't realize that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. To which they're like, wait a minute, you're not even 50 years old. What, you've seen Father Abraham? And, and, and let's be honest, there's some things that Jesus is saying, if we were in their shoes, we would be confused about. Right? For all they knew, he was a 33 or 32, 33-year-old rabbi, somewhere around there, right? And, and for all they knew... That hadn't changed. It wasn't common for other people to live longer than, than even hundreds of years, right? And so Abraham was thousands of years old. There was no way Abraham would have seen Jesus in their eyes. They didn't understand what he was, he was trying to say. And so they were like, what are you talking about? Which leads Jesus to, to make the I am statement that he does. Again, if at this point they don't realize who he is, and, and we know that they realize at least who he's claiming to be, because he says, I am. The very words that God told Moses in the burning bush. The name that God used. And so they realize that Jesus is making a claim to divinity, which is what leads them to do what they did in picking up the stones to stone him. All right? But I want us to think about their reaction. Even in the midst of things that they didn't understand. Was it really honoring to God, their father, to the king? Did it point people to truth or did it just cause uh, people to, to wander further and further away in that crowd? See, we're called to re react to situations in ways that would honor our king, that do help point people to truth. Why is this so important? Why is it important that we should pay attention to the ways that we're reacting to, our, to the circumstances around us, even the ones that we don't understand or even the ones we do? 
Because reactions reflect a heart condition again. Our words and our actions tell a story. And if we're meant to produce kingdom fruit, good fruit that pleases our king, when we produce fruit that isn't good, it's pointing out something that maybe we need to consider in a moment. Maybe we're heading down a wrong path. I mean, think about if, if some of the, the leaders and the, the people in the crowd, that they would have been willing to say, you know what? I mean, we're, we're sitting here trying to get this guy to, to reveal the truth. We're trying to figure out, is he the Messiah or not? And, and, and if he is, you know, what, what that means for us. And, and really, he's, he's not saying the things we want him to say and definitely not doing the things that we're approving of all the time. And so... We're asking questions, and then we're getting kind of frustrated. And then, wait a minute, what guy in the crowd accused him of being a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Like, if there was somebody who was, I want to honor God in my actions, I would have been like, you know what? This doesn't feel right. It seems like we might be going down a wrong path. And right, right, all we're doing is insulting this guy with things that we know not to be true, proving the things that he's already trying to get us to understand, that we are following the example of our father. Reactions reflect the heart condition. There's this passage that Jesus says in Luke 6. He says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Do our reactions honor the king? Are we producing good fruit? And if we're not, well, then, okay, let's leave room for God to speak in those moments. But let's pay attention to the ways that we're reacting and, and whether or not we're pointing people to truth or away from truth. You know, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of um, uncertainty, things that we're not getting and, and things we, we might even be confused about, it can be tempting to want to defend ourselves, right? I mean, think about it. That's what this, these religious leaders were trying to do in the eyes of the people. They were trying to get Jesus to react any way that they could so that people would reject him and come back to them. And so they were, they were throwing insults and all those things. But Jesus gives us the right example. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to get into this argument that's really going to go nowhere. You seek to dishonor me. I can't control that. I seek to honor God. I seek to react in a way that pleases the king. Man, it is tempting to want to defend yourself when you're needed, needlessly being attacked by someone else, isn't it? But we've got to pay attention to this. Because if we're following our king, our reactions will show, a, tell a story. The fruit that we produce will point whether we're truly following him or not. And not only can it be tempting to defend ourselves, it can just be tempting to respond poorly in general, Right? when we don't understand something, when things aren't going the way that we think that they should go, when, 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 when we're confused about something, we can respond poorly and, and do a host of other things, whether it's attacking somebody else or whether it's, it's um, going in the wrong direction, whatever it happens to be. You see, all that the religious leaders and the people in the audience that day could, could do was slander Jesus without cause. And they were continuing to do that. At one point, they called him a glutton and a, and a drunkard. At another point, they called him um, various th things throughout the course of his ministry, seeking to slander him and get people to stop trusting in him. Because they were more focused on serving their own purposes than allowing their actions to honor what God had entrusted them to do. You see, for the religious leaders, what, what should have happened is that they should have been pointing people to Jesus because they were paying attention to what God was speaking and they saw what Jesus had come to, to do and they should have been the ones saying, listen, he's the one, he's the savior. He's the one we need to listen to. Let us follow our king, let us give him our hearts. But they didn't want that. And they were unwilling to consider and pay attention to, to, to their own reactions. And so all they could do is continue to react in a way that created problems. And so as we look at these truths, these competencies that, again, they're, they're meant to help us follow our king. When we leave room for him to speak, when, when overall he has our hearts and our allegiance, 
When, when we are paying attention to, to the way that we're reacting and, and, and honoring him. And when we are pointing people to truth instead of pointing people away from the truth that they need to grab a hold of. So as we think about these things, what truths can we consider as, as we're seeking to follow Jesus? First one is this. We have to be willing to make kingdom adjustments to our lives. Jesus continues to point out, and he's going to continue to, to say the same thing. He came to give life. Right? This, this gospel was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. Not that you might wait for life, that you might have it. That you might experience life. That you might experience the joys of living in his kingdom. The joys of what it looks like to, to, to walk closely to the king. And so when, if that's true, if that's what he came to give us, we have to be willing to, to consider are there areas in our lives where the way that we live isn't lined up with the way that the king has called us to live? Do we need to make adjustments? Do we need to change direction in some area? Let go of something that's not helping us follow Jesus. And so, do you take the time to pause and consider the fruit of your life? In your conversations with your spouse this week, have they honored the king? In the ways that you have been investing in the lives of your children and your grandchildren and your neighbors, have they been honoring to the king? Are there, are there some areas where maybe you're not truly living in the kingdom? Like, you're trying to do that thing where, hey, I'll visit part of the week, whatever part that happens to be for you, and then I want to go do my own kingdom thing. Kevin preached a sermon about being on God's uh, team or, 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 or my team, my kingdom, God's kingdom, right, while I was in Israel. Is that true? Or are we trying to... The, the thing is, is that we think that we can do both, right? We think that we can be on offense when we want to be on offense and be on defense, whatever serves our purposes, whatever seems more desirable in the moment. And so we ask, is there some areas that we need to be willing to make some adjustments? And so we look at the fruit of our lives. Is it, is it fruit that, that, that Jesus said, this is the fruit you're meant to produce? You know, as you look at the, your conversations, your actions, is it love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Is it those fruits of the Spirit that Paul identifies in Galatians 5? Or is there, is there some anger in there? Is there some um, desire for pleasure in whatever form it happens to be taken? Is there adjustments that need to be made because we're called to, to live in the kingdom, to follow our king? And that means we, we seek to produce kingdom fruit as is reflected in, in Jesus' teachings. And so what, what God has done, because he's so good, is he realizes that for all of us, again, there's times where we need to make adjustments. There's times where we're doing exactly what God wants us to do, and we're experiencing the joy of the Lord and our relationships and, and all those things. There, there are definitely those moments, meant to be those moments. But there's other moments because we go through a difficult, difficult situation or because we're put to the test in various forms where, where maybe we, we begin to, to just shift a little bit. But God said, I, I'm giving you my spirit, and he's going to remind you of the things that I have taught. He's going to convict you of righteousness and convict you of sin as well. He's going to lead you back into all truth. But here, here's the thing. I really want us to think of that song we sang before, um, before the sermon. If we're not in that position saying, Lord, word of God speak right now. I need you to speak into this circumstance. I need, to, I need to hear if I need to make some adjustments. I need to get into your word and just allow it to do what it was meant to do. I need you to speak. I'm willing to make whatever adjustment I need to if it helps me to live like you've called me to live. And so what prevents us from making those adjustments? Well, one, we don't, we don't give them room. We don't give them the access to certain areas of our life. We think we can control that, that it's not going to spill over and produce destruction into other areas. Lord, this is just, this is my room, 
and, and, and it's because it, it gives me pleasures or, or joys or, or because I've become dependent upon it in certain times, and, and, but you can't have access. It's, I'm not going to align that with your teaching. And so that's one of the reasons. The, the, the religious leaders and those in our passage, they, they kind of exemplify that for us. They didn't give Jesus room. They didn't give him access. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. One other thing can also be we don't realize God's expectations. Again, we don't realize that he, he expects us to, to, to give him our hearts, to surrender. And that's a good thing. Like that's, that's actually one of the greatest things that we could ever do is give God our hearts and devotion. We don't realize that that's his expectation or we're being deceived by something else. Or, or simply we just are seeking to make the wrong adjustments in our life because we think that that adjustment is going to produce the, the peace that we're longing for or, or, or give us the strength that we need or, or lead to the success we want to experience. Are we willing to make kingdom adjustments? If we want to experience life, like the scriptures talk about, we need to be willing. There's this uh, comic strip I, I love. I, I, when I remember in seventh grade, I used to, I, we'd have this, uh, it was called Achievement Hour, and it was basically study hour, right? You could do homework. Well, as a seventh grader, I was less interested in doing homework and more interested in reading comic books. And so, um, so there was this one particular comic book that, that I used to love reading in, in class, and it was Calvin and Hobbes. A lot of great truths come from the mouth of Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> Usually in the form of what, what, what's not true is the opposite. But um, in one scene, Calvin says to, you know, if you're not familiar with Calvin and Hobbes, one, the, 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 you need to. It's great, good, good stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't going to say it's vital, but um, it, it, it can be, it can, it can <laughs> yeah. Anyways, get familiar with Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, and Calvin is this little boy, and he has this, pet tiger who's kind of like an imaginary friend, and they go on adventures. And he says to the, um, Hobbes, I feel bad that I called Susie names and hurt her feelings. I'm sorry I did it. And, and Hobbes looks at him and says, well, maybe you should apologize to her. Calvin ponders that for a minute, and then he replies, I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. <laughs> so think about that for a minute. If you're experiencing pain, destruction, regret, frustrations, whatever it happens to be, God's word says turn back and come to him. Repent. Make an adjustment. And I think we keep looking at our situations going, yeah, I know that's what I should do, but I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. I keep hoping that something else will, you know, I I really, I know know that's probably what I need to do, but I just don't want to do it. But what happens when we're unwilling to consider this reality that we are called to to make kingdom adjustments in our lives? Adjustments that reflect the teachings of of God's kingdom. Well, we miss opportunities. And sometimes we end up in the wrong place. It doesn't mean that God can't help us get back from where where we go. But it does mean, unless there's a change we'll probably continue to experience a lot of the destruction we wish we could avoid. And one of the the things that that, that it can lead us to is we can end up in the position of the Pharisees where we are actually working against God's purposes for our life, where we're actually resisting him, where he is actually resisting our efforts as well. We have to be willing to make kingdom adjustments God's desire is to bring life. So why wouldn't we want to? The other thing, we need to help others recognize their allegiance, where it is, and its outcomes. I've been thinking about this this a lot um, as a whole within our culture. And when it comes to a family level, when it comes to, to the things that we do in our, within our homes, how much does God have our allegiance? Our, our, me and my kids have had conversations at, at, at various times just thinking about, you know, what we end up serving throughout the day. You know, 
Sometimes we end up serving food. Sometimes we end up serving cell phones or TVs or, you know, they have our allegiance. They, they occupy our time. They, they are what we turn to for, for, for joy and happiness. They are the things that are influencing the people we're becoming. So I've had these conversations and I'm thinking about, does God have our allegiance? Does, does he have our hearts? And I think one of the things that if we're going to see a, a change in our culture, one, it, it has to start on a personal level, right? Jesus has to become king again. But we have to return to understanding the importance of, of what we do as a family, what we're allegiant to, who we actually serve. That might call to mind a passage that many of you are probably familiar with. May, I'm guessing that there's at least a dozen people here who who have, have it at your home on a sign somewhere. Joshua 24, 15. In that passage, they're going into the promised land, and Joshua tells them this because they've been serving themselves, and uh, you know, in the past they had served themselves, and, and the temptation to serve the gods around them. And he says, if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's got to be more than a sign on our doors. It's got to be more than a placemat. We have to look at that verse and consider, as a family, what has our allegiance? What are we serving? How am I helping my kids know that, and, and, my, and, and for, for others, grandkids or, or those around us, those that God has, has given us the uh, opportunity, the privilege to invest in and interact with, how are we helping them realize what has their allegiance and what outcome that's going to be led to? I ask this question of, our, of my kids and, and of myself, really. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Uh, we, I, I can't remember. It was like a week or two ago. Or maybe it was just the other day. It's all blurring a little bit. I said, what would happen if dad came home one day and said, you know what? I'm putting the TV in the box. I'm putting your phones in a crate for an entire week. There won't be TV. There won't be phones in our house. There won't be any devices, computers, none of it. How would we respond? I mean, me as a, as a dad, because I, there's times where, hey, I've got 10 minutes to kill. What's on Facebook? Oh, I got 10 minutes to go. Let me play a game. And there's a danger of those things having more allegiance in our lives than God's word. And if there's going to be a return to kingdom living in our lives, we've got to ask ourselves, are we, as a family, truly following the king? Whom do we serve? Now, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean necessarily that um, because we have a cell phone and because we're on social media or because we're watching TV that that's necessarily bad. In its right place, those are good gifts of God's grace that we can enjoy that can refresh us at times. But there are also things that can keep us from listening to God, from seeking his word, from investing in a conversation with kids and grandkids and, and spouses and, and neighbors. They can take our time, require our allegiance. And what are they producing? So again, it's not that we have to reject all of that, but we have to ask ourselves, are we serving that more than we serve God? And then I think about this, if we're to help others recognize their allegiance, uh, on a church level, are we committed to helping one another follow the king? Are we committed to, to coming alongside and supporting? Because the, the reality that we've got to recognize is this. As a church, and I'm speaking across the country, I'm not speaking on Sunfield alone. As a church as a whole, we haven't always been allegiant to God's purposes. We've elevated things that he would rather us not elevate, and we've neglected things that he, he, he thinks are really important. One of those happened to be the investing in our families and pouring in and making disciples in our own homes that know what it means to be allegiant to him. 
what the outcome of that allegiance is. And so we ask ourselves, are we helping other people around us recognize where their allegiance is? Not in a way that's pointing and condemning, but in a way that's calling people back to follow God with all their hearts. One of the things we should think about as well is, are we even hesitant to talk about our king and what it looks like to live in his kingdom? And why is that? I think oftentimes it's because we haven't made it the norm where, where church has, in some places, become nothing more than another social club where we have a portion devoted to God, but then everything else is, is, is conversations that we would have if it was McDonald's. Let's make it the norm to talk about the king and his business. Two other things before I begin to draw to a close. Draw to a close. If we're going to help people recognize their allegiance, we've got to be mindful of our own. Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 7, why do you focus on the speck of dust in your brother's eye and not focus on the log that's in your own eye? Look at your own allegiances, and then you'll be able to see clearly and help other people clearly um, remove, address their own. So we, we pay attention to, to what's going on, our own allegiances. But then we also remember this truth. This, this call to help people live in the kingdom, that, that's one of the expectations that the king gave to all of us. Right? He, he called us to make disciples, immerse them in the name, Father, Holy, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what's that third part? Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Right? We're meant to help people know what it looks like to follow Jesus. And, and part of the, the, the starting point that we've got to focus on is helping them realize where their allegiance is and, and make the adjustment necessary to begin living in the kingdom. So we, as we look at this passage, as we're finishing up chapter 8 this morning, we're reminded of the truth. Children of God, children of Abraham, followers of Christ, however you want to say it, they follow the king. They look more like the one they follow. And so we, we, we look at these competencies, these things that are meant to help us to do something well or efficiently. And we realize we need to leave room for our king to speak in our lives. We need to understand and really ask ourselves if he has our allegiance. And we need to pay attention to the ways that we're reacting Asking ourselves, is it honoring to, to the king and is it pointing people to truth? Adjusting our mindset, if necessary. See, our response, our willingness to adjust reflects our condition. And so let's desire to be dependent upon God daily. Leaving room for him to use us and, leave, and leaving room to, for him to help us adjust if necessary. I'm going to finish with the story of a man named General William Booth. If you're not familiar with him, he was, he, him and his wife, they, they were the ones who founded the, Salva the Salvation Army. And he was once asked to reveal the secret of his success. And so after some hesitation, you know, he could have said, well, you know, I had these programs and, and they just, you know, took off like wildfire and I, I'm a really smart guy. I got it all down. I, or, you know, I work really hard. He could have said a lot of different things. He said this, though. I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision for what Jesus could do with them, on that day I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth that there was. It was this which led the person who was interviewing them to remark, I learned from William Booth that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender, particularly the measure of his surrender to the king. You see, God isn't looking for those with great abilities. He's looking for those with great availability, those who want to follow him, those who aren't necessarily caught up in, in making a, a great name for themselves but are look, looking to make a great impact for the kingdom of God. These competencies can help us do that because they, 
cause us to remember the truth that we need to leave room for God to use us and to help us adjust as he sees fit. And so, as you're listening to this message, what, is God, what area of your life is God speaking towards right now? Is he speaking on a personal level? Is he speaking maybe on a family level? Is he helping us realize that we can very easily fall into the same trap that those religious leaders do where we're actually working against his purposes for our life? And, and not only working against his purposes, but making it hard for others to see their purposes in him as well. How are we going to respond to this message? I want you to take a moment. I want you to reflect on the word. I want you to think what God wants you to do. Maybe just choose one thing. One thing that you can do in light of this sermon. One adjustment that you can make that would honor your king this week. Reflect on the message before the worship team leads us for our last song. Thank mm-hmm. you.